fourth chapter at the first verse. This is page 224 in your few Bible, if that helps. Ruth chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. I ran into a Christian brother uh, this morning on my walk with Strider. He was walking his little girly dog. And uh, <clears throat> we finished the walk uh, together. And uh, he, uh, he's, this brother loves his Bible and and uh, we were talking about Ruth uh, and the book we're studying. And he said to me, John, you know what uh, Boaz was like before he met Ruth, right? I, I have no idea. He said, he was ruthless. <laughs> uh, it's a moan. It's moan worthy, I know. <laughs> Groan worthy. So this is, I believe, the penultimate uh, sermon on uh, Ruth for us. The conclusion coming uh, next week. In the closing verses of chapter 4, I say I believe this is the penultimate study because uh, we've spent a whole lot more time in Ruth than I had actually anticipated we might, and now in hindsight I see that we might have actually spent more time in it than we have. But uh, I hope that you've been blessed as I have from this marvelous book and the time we've spent dwelling together in this delightful history. Speaking of history, may I uh, remind you quickly... Uh, the outline of the story thus far. You remember that uh, Ruth, uh, the, the narrator uh, tells us at the beginning of Ruth, that is, uh, that, uh, that Ruth was set in the days of the judges. And you and I know immediately what that means, the time when everyone was doing what was right in his own eyes. It was during that time that a man named Elimelech and his wife Naomi with their sons Malan and Kilian, left Bethlehem, literally left uh, Bethlehem, the house of bread in Judah, to head for the wicked land of Moab in search of bread, because there was none to be found in Bethlehem. While in Moab, the boys marry Moabite girls named Orpah and Ruth, but soon thereafter, all three men are dead, and there remain just three widows. Two of those widows, Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth, make their way back to Bethlehem upon hearing that there is bread once again in the house of bread, and they arrive there just in time for the beginning of the barley harvest. Ruth, taking full advantage of God's law making that made provision for the poor through work, uh, goes into the field and gleans behind the reapers, uh, and behold, <laughs> surprise, she finds herself in Boaz's field, a relative of Elimelech's and therefore of Naomi's and therefore of hers. A kinsman redeemer uh, he is because of his relationship with them. In other words, a person who's in the position, if he so chooses, to help them. A man, I say, whose name is Boaz. Everybody's named. That's going to be important. Boaz, as we saw last time, indeed is willing to help. He's glad, as a matter of fact, to act as a redeemer to them. His heart has been turned toward Ruth, and Ruth's has been turned toward him. Ruth has even proposed marriage to Boaz in a most fascinating and risky way that we saw last time, and Boaz is glad for it. But there's a hitch. And um, a different kind of hitch. There is a, a problem. One that neither Naomi nor Ruth had anticipated. We heard about it uh, for the first time last week, didn't we? Whispered in Boaz's hushed tones in the darkness in the nighttime threshing floor. One problem, my daughter, there is a kinsman who is closer than I, and he gets first dibs. I'm Paraphrasing a little bit, but um, uh, first right of refusal, if you like. He will have to be consulted first, and Ruth's heart probably sunk in her chest at the sound of that news. But Naomi, now no longer lashing out at the world and at God over her losses, assures her daughter-in-law that Boaz will not let the grass grow under his feet before he takes care of this. And that's the last we heard in chapter 3. Wait, my daughter, uh, she says to 
Ruth. Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. That's where we pick up. Thank you for your patience for that recap in chapter 4. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for the wonders that it holds for us. And they truly are wonders. What we're going to read this morning is among them. And so we pray that you would uh, loosen our hearts from its bondage to dullness and uh, thrill us once again with the news of our salvation. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Ruth chapter 4, we're going to read the first 12 verses. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took <coughs> ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down there. And so they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and Malan. Also Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of Malan, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. Boaz... Boaz, Boaz, we could even say it in Hebrew, what are you doing? <laughs> Boaz, Boaz, why are you putting on the brakes and the whole thing here, the engagement, the, 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 to Ruth, the redemption of Naomi, the family of Elimelech, you have the girl, Boaz. In fact, it was all her idea. She's the one who proposed you get hitched. What are you doing? You're risking everything. You've recognized the risk he's taking, right? I, I mean, you can't you hear him saying it? I, I'd love to marry you, Ruth. In fact, Ruth, there's nothing in the world 
I'd rather do right now. I am a redeemer. I am a kinsman of yours, a kinsman redeemer. But there's a closer relative, and we have to consult him first. That's what this whole episode is about. You know, if Boaz slept at all that night after discovering Ruth uh, there at his feet and uh, their conversation about marriage, it wasn't much, was it? He was thinking carefully, wasn't he? He was planning his visit that morning to the city gate, and he was praying about it as well, the place where the important decisions were, were made. You can see that any number of places in the Bible, at the gate, at the gate. So, so straightway he makes his way to the gate, and behold, <laughs> surprise, Again, what a surprise. Just like when Ruth just happened into Boaz's field. Just like when, behold, Boaz shows up at just the right time. Now, just in the Lord's perfect providential timing, shows up the nameless Redeemer candidate. Nameless, I point out to you, because in a book that has been all about names, and their meanings and their significance, as we've seen. And in a chapter that is all about perpetuating the name of Elimelech, this guy remains nameless. Strikingly so. He's the only character in this book who doesn't have a name. Doesn't get a name from the narrator. Boaz says, turn aside friend, sit down here. Actually, that English translation, friend, is very generous. Literally, he says in the Hebrew, hey, so-and-so, hey, you, hey, so-and-so, sit down here. And he does. Boaz wrangles a quorum of ten elders and says, you sit down here. And they do, apparently. <laughs> Boaz is some clout in this community, doesn't he? And suddenly the gate has been transformed into a proper courtroom. And he wastes no time in starting the legal proceedings. He explains the situation. Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative, he says to the nameless redeemer, our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. Now our English translation assumes that Naomi is actually selling a piece of land uh, we know, however, from Mosaic law that she has no right to sell that land, even though she is the widow. Likely, what's being described here is that she's going to sell the use of the property for a period of time, that property having fallen into someone else's hands due to the poverty that had driven or led Elimelech and Naomi out of Bethlehem to begin with. But... Um, you, the law, you see, also provided a way to redeem it, to redeem that land, to bring that land back under family control. And that was the job of the goel. You've heard that term before. That's the Hebrew word for the kinsman redeemer. Now, this is the first we've heard about land in the whole isn't it, about land that she held anyway. And Naomi hasn't said a word about that concern, but Boaz is acting very wisely here, isn't he? Very shrewdly. He knows that it is the land that is providing the opportunity to put things right here and for moving forward in marriage to Ruth. Now, it's all a little more complicated than, than that, but I'm simplifying for the sake of time. So, so you're, are you going to redeem it or not, he says, to this other nameless fellow. If not, I will, says Boaz. I will. Uh, and and the, the nameless redeemer says, I will redeem it. No. Oh. Did, did you hear the sound of, the, of that needle scratching across the vinyl record? You know, you know, all of a sudden the story goes to this terrible screeching halt. Things have been going swimmingly so far, haven't they? Wonderfully and suddenly... All is lost. All is lost. The marriage is off. The girl is gone. Or is she? Boaz 
has an ace up his sleeve, or maybe better in the house of the Lord, we should say he has a plan B. He has been acting to quote Jesus, wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove. While so-and-so is already whipping out his pen to sign on the dotted line, Boaz quickly adds this, oh, wait, 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 wait there. Let's not start chucking uh, sandals around. (laughs) There's this matter of a widow. While you're expanding your real estate portfolio, so-and-so, he explains, you are also acquiring Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Now, again, we don't have time to go into all the fine details, and frankly, there's much we don't really grasp about the ancient laws and how they interacted and were at play here, but apparently the law of leveret marriage, and we remember what that means, that the brother-in-law of a barren widow was to marry his brother's widow and to have children with her in order to perpetuate his uh, late brother's name and to preserve his inheritance for his late brother's sake, I say somehow the form of the principle of leveret marriage is understood here to be a necessary part of the Redeemer's responsibilities. In sum, it comes down to this, uh, when you get the land, you get a Moabite wife, and you get whatever children come from that union. They all come as a package deal. We can imagine so-and-so's face turning pale, the blood running out from his face as he begins to stammer. Well, uh, hmm, that is, I, uh, hmm, I can't. Uh, uh, I mean, I've got my own wife and kids and I can't really afford to take this, uh, what did you say, uh, uh, Moabite uh, widow on. I, I mean, I got my own kids growing up. They need clothes. They need food. Uh, the orthodontist says they need braces. You know, college is coming up. Lots of expenses. Come to think of it, you go ahead, Boaz. You, you go ahead and, and redeem. Uh, turns out uh, I can't do it after all. See, what he doesn't want to risk is his own children's inheritance, their portion in the land, and that's what it really comes down to. So so he takes a pass. Then they seal the deal in front of all those elders, and apparently before the crowd of people who had gathered, deduce that from verse 11, confirming it all with the customary removing of the sandal and the the giving of it to the other party, and -and so-and-so does that, he He does exactly that. He takes his sandal off, hands it to Boaz, and Boaz now standing with his sandal so that everybody can see, people and elders alike. He says, you are witnesses this day. I've bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilian and Malon, also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon. I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among uh, his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. And because there is no Hebrew word for yes, (laughs) uh, they repeat back. uh, We are witnesses. (laughs) That was close, wasn't it? That was a close one. I mean, did your breath catch in your lungs when so-and-so said, sure, I'll redeem it? Again, we ask, as we did a few minutes ago, Boaz, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Why are you risking everything this way? And the answer is very, very simple. Boaz must do what is right. Boaz is a righteous 
man. And he must, because he's a man of his word and because he's a man of the word, his conscience is bound by the law of God. He must do what is right, what is righteous, what is obedient. A few weeks ago after worship, one of you caught me in the parking lot to point out that what Boaz has been doing all along all this ministry and provision for Ruth and so on, leaving barley stalks on the edges of the field. Not, on, not just for Ruth now. We remember, he was already obeying the law of God, leaving, field, leaving uh, barley on the, on the edges of his field for gleaners, and I just gave it away. He's not just being gracious. He is being obedient. He's obeying the law of God, which is... Gracious, isn't it? The law of God is so gracious. It has grace built into it, doesn't it? And he is being obedient. He's obeying the law of God. He, and so, continuing on, he simply must clear this matter with a closer Redeemer who is in line before him according to the law of God. And this is very important, isn't it? And there's a, there's a grand point to draw from all of that. I mean, grand, the big grand point to draw. And I certainly want to get to that in just a moment. But first, may I point, to you, point this out to you, that Boaz is a wonderful model here for us. Boaz obeys. Boaz keeps the law of God, even when doing so may cost him and cost him dearly. He will not cut corners when it comes to obedience to the law of God. Does he want to marry Ruth? <laughs> we must not have eyes in our heads if we don't see that he wants to marry Ruth and with every fiber of his being, but not at the expense of what is right not at the expense of what is obedient, not at the expense of what the law of God requires, even if it means losing her, he will obey. Let me ask you, do you obey God like this? Will you obey God this way? When from your puny perspective, it seems perfectly clear that obedience may and likely will hurt. That it will cost you, and maybe dearly so. At what price are you willing to obey the Lord? I remember years ago, uh, many years ago, uh, one of the uh, main employers of many Many of our men in one of our sister uh, churches in the presbytery uh, was a printing firm. Entire families were, humanly speaking, uh, dependent on that income for their daily bread that was not found uh, easily uh, from any other company nearby. And then one day, that printing firm started printing pornography. And suddenly several families were faced, several fathers, husbands were faced with a decision. Do they obey God and quit their jobs? Happily, they chose obedience, but it was costly obedience. There are all manner of situations today that present Christians with the same, shall we call them, opportunities to obey men and women, for example, who would love with all of their hearts to marry, but who simply cannot find a believer, will find themselves oftentimes tempted to marry that gal who is so sweet and so pretty, or that guy who is very considerate and, and seems to have everything going for him but he's not a believer, or he's not a believer fit for marriage. Or the same finds himself or herself so 
desperately lonely and the night so very, very long and so-and-so is willing to share a bed for the night. Obedience is hard. Christian couples desperate to have children are offered the opportunities and spades to pursue fertility if only they will be willing to freeze a bunch of embryos and, and uh, the destruction of their own single cell children. The husband and father of a large family is offered a promotion that will provide much needed funds, not for a vacation to Hawaii, to pay the Christian school tuition bills but only if he is willing to bend corporate laws to the breaking point or to lie on company records. Obedience is hard. You students, you feel pressured to cheat in order to pass your tests or to give up uh, obedience to the fourth commandment and study on the Sabbath day so that you can pass those Monday morning exams. You, you know, we could go on and on and on the list of scenarios and examples. Here Boaz is a luminary for us, isn't he? When obedience risks our own unhappiness, indeed it appears to us that there is no other alternative. Obedience will put us in a state of pain and difficulty and trial of loss, of hurt. Boaz, I say, shows us the way. Like the children's song we sing together or sang in our family worship years ago when the kids were little, O-B-E-Y, Obey. Brothers and sisters, the only way forward for you and for me in any situation and in all situations is the obedient way, the lawful way, the right way. Obedience is hard, isn't it? Oftentimes. But God never acts apart from his law or in a way that is out of accord with his own commandments. God's way of blessing is always, always the way of obedience to his commandments. So we simply must frame our lives in accord with the law of God. But I mentioned a moment ago that there's a much greater, a grand application to make of Boaz's obedience, and is this. In obeying God, as a redeemer of Ruth, uh, Boaz is to us a living picture of our, capital R, Redeemer, Jesus he too was obedient, wasn't he? In just exactly the ways we needed him most to be obedient. Think about it. Boaz has here a terrible legal dilemma. We had a terrible legal dilemma too. Our legal dilemma rose from the fact that we had disobeyed God's law. We had broken God's commandments with our sin. And our dilemma apart from Christ was absolutely impossible. I mean, according to Scripture, the penalty for us unequivocally is death. Disobedience to God brought death. But a Redeemer appeared on the scene. Not a nameless one, not some so-and-so who was unwilling to do what is right and therefore has justly been, you know, left forever nameless in the dustbin of history, but one who, like Boaz, is an obedient redeemer, and we know him by name, don't we? Jesus. This time of year, we hear ringing in our ears the news from the angel to Joseph. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name. He is named Jesus. For he, what, will 
save his people from their sins. That's what his name means, Savior. This he has done. He's redeemed us, and he has done so precisely through obedience. Have you ever stopped to consider that your salvation was accomplished through obedience? As we've been considering in our evening worship these many weeks from Philippians 2, he came to earth taking the form of a servant and being made found, being found in human form, he humbled himself becoming what? Obedient. Obedient even to the point of death, even death on the cross. He, remember, came to fulfill all righteousness. He was, as Paul reminds us, born, thank you, Elder Thomas, thank you for the wonderful way you blend your prayers with our sermons when you pray. Did you hear it this morning? He was born of a woman, born under law, under the law's curse to redeem us who are under the law. We're under the law's curse, that is. Boaz redeemed Ruth and Naomi with some form of payment, didn't he? Probably gold or silver. Jesus redeemed us through obedience to his Father, paying the redemption price not with coin. Stack coins to the heavens. There's not enough of them to pay. No, he paid with blood. His own precious blood shed for us so that in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Could it be, you ask? Could it really be? Be? Can it be that I am redeemed by his blood? Me? After all I've done? After all I continue to do? Could a sinner as bad as I be redeemed, really? Be purchased by his blood? That's the question we all ought to be asking ourselves, and very often. Consider with me the blessing that the people add to Boaz at the conclusion of this transaction. It's a wonderful one, a three-part blessing, beginning at verse 11. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. Three-part blessing. One, may the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. Two, may you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And three, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will bring you by this young woman. Now, there is a treasure trove, I think, uh, in those three, uh, in the three-part blessing. But so Boaz is truly renowned. His name is known to this day, isn't it? I'm jumping to the second one. It's known to this day, not only Bethlehem, but, but around the world. Here we are in Owensboro, Kentucky. We're talking about Boaz. In stark contrast, of course, to you-know-who. Mr. So-and-so, uh, who missed a great opportunity to obey and find himself included by name in the history of redemption. Oh, what a sad, sad story. Is Mr. So and so. But you know, the real eye popper in the blessing is the third part. Like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Really? And of course, the main point is that Boaz's house should be prolific with many children. But do you remember the history of Tamar and Judah? Do you remember it? Do you remember how after a disastrous, yes, fatal failure of leveret marriage in Judah's family, how Tamar, in desperation, dresses herself as a prostitute and tricks her father-in-law, Judah, into an encounter 
that results in her pregnancy. There's all of that history coming back to you now. And the scandal of it all on both parts, on Judah's and on Tamar's. Prostitution. Incest. You tell me, if you were writing this history, if you were the narrator of Ruth, would you have included this? If you were writing, leave that alone. If you were writing your own family's history, you know, wouldn't you rather kind of politely, you know, throw a, a sort of veil over the scandals of your family's past and the sins of your generations. Yet right here, and what we know, I think you know this, will prove ultimately to be the family history of no one less than Jesus, our Savior. We have included these dark, very dark, scandalous and shameful sins. The Bible makes no effort whatsoever to cover them up. It actually, the Bible continues <laughs> over and over to bring them to our attention. Why? Why in the world would be, we be told in the line of our Savior's family about how it was pocked with such glaring and ugly, even scandalous sins. Well, I think it certainly is to underscore the point that our Savior, our Redeemer, came specifically, precisely for sinners. He came. Jesus said it plainly himself. I don't have to make this up. Jesus said, I have come not for the righteous, but for sinners. This is why I've come. He's talking about the self-righteous, isn't he? I've not come for the righteous. I've come for sinners. This is the gospel. Dear ones, this is the good news. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what your parents have done or your grandparents or where your great-grandparents have been or what they've done either. No matter who you are, no matter your history, no matter your sins. Have you committed incest? Have you prostituted yourself? There is grace for you. There is more grace for you than you will ever need. There is more grace than ever your need will require. In fact, Paul says, astoundingly, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. What keeps you? What keeps you from this Savior? What keeps you from coming into this inheritance into this redemption. Joseph Hart in his hymn put it wonderfully, come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. Let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. 
This is what the book of Ruth is all about. This is all that the Ruth, book of Ruth has ever been about. And yes, it is a lovely story, isn't it, about loss and love, about earthy things, uh, about relatives and relationships and, and wheat and barley. But ultimately, ultimately, it's about redemption. It's about our Redeemer. It's about the salvation. It's about the gospel. It's about the good news of salvation for sinners, for outsiders, aliens like you. And like me, who like Ruth were on the outside and have been brought in. And God has spread his gracious wing over you and over me and saved us. He has married you to himself. Yes, you. Could it be? Yes, it could and it is you. There is a Redeemer, Jesus God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One.